Thank you. So, and immediately after this, uh, uh, right after five will be the closing ceremonies of JulieCon, and I think in 26100. So we'll just, you know, head over there after this. <laughs> Um, so as I showed from the picture here, I have the increasingly rare distinction of having been at MIT longer than, than Alan. I arrived as an undergraduate in 91 and never really left, although Jerry Sussman in the front row has us both beat by a few decades, I believe. 1964, yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, but I never left, so, uh, or I, I got one. I got, <laughs> I got one foot out the door, uh, you know, uh, 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 with a half post, uh, joint postdoc at Harvard. But uh, yeah, so I didn't actually cross paths with Alan though until, uh, in, in, until 1997 when I took his parallel scientific computing class. Uh, and my, my final project for that was a, a little software package called FFTW, which some of you may have used. Um, so this talk is not about software and it's not about research. I'm not gonna present any, any original results uh, it's, it's just about pedagogy. It's, a, it's about a class uh, that Alan and I have taught now for twice, uh, both in the, in the January, this is, this is a one month intersection period at MIT. So we just gave eight two hour lectures, so 16 hours of lectures uh, on a course called Matrix Calculus for Machine Learning and Beyond was, the, I believe, the original title. Yeah, bring in the customers, yeah. And so this is a sophomore level class, so it's just the only requirements are you know, multivariable calculus, 1802, and basic linear algebra, 1806. And you know, it's, it's something that I, I think should be a topic that's, that's part of more and more undergraduate curriculums, uh, even more than it already is. And it was actually inspired by a question uh, on the math major forum uh, that was, uh, I'll show you in a minute. So the class is matrix, is matrix calculus, uh, but of calculus, it's really only about the easy part of calculus, which is the derivatives, right? And, and this is a great cartoon from XKCD about d differentiation versus X, uh, integration, right? And you know, we, we all think of, uh, of derivatives as the easy part of calculus, because you learn a few rules, the power rule, the chain rule, the, the product rule, maybe the, the derivatives of a few special functions, sine and cosine and so forth, and then you're done. You can do everything, right? So if, if, for example, if I, if I ask you, what's the derivative of x squared? Everyone say it with me, it's 2x. If I say derivative of, of, of 1 over x, it's minus 1 over x squared, right? It, it's like an automatic reflex that bounces off your spinal cord. It, it, it completely bypasses your brain, right? You don't even have to think about it. You don't think about it. Um, and so it's a solved problem. We don't, we, we're done with derivatives. We don't have to think about it anymore. So it can be, we can make it a little bit harder. So let's, let's suppose f of x is x squared, but now x is not a number, it's a square matrix, so we, uh, m by m matrix. So of course, if you pattern match, you say, oh, 2x. No, that's not only wrong, that's, that's not even wrong, right? It's, it, it's, it's like not, not even the right kind of thing, right? So we, we have to think about, you know, what, what is, what does this even mean to take the derivative of x squared or x inverse with respect to x when x is a matrix? Well, you could say, well, there's m squared inputs, there's m squared outputs, so there should be some kind of m squared by m squared Jacobian, so there's m to the fourth derivatives, right? And th that's true, you could do it that, think of it that way, and you could even write out the formula for the you know, product of two matrices of, of x with itself, and then take the derivative of every element, it's not so crazy, right? For x inverse, uh, you know, you can maybe write out Kramer's rule or something, or maybe think about carrying the chain rule through Gauss elimination, but this is not, does not seem uh, so, so doable by human at least, right? You can imagine let, letting the computer do it, they just let, let it blindly chug through these, and, and, and computers are, you know, are good at tedious calculations, and, and chain rules through lots of things are tedious, but you know, how, how expensive is it? it, it naively, if, if this is m to the fourth derivatives, you think the, the cost would be, would be at least m to the fourth, right? Uh, if the cost of each derivative is order one. And so this, this is kind of, this direction leads, I would say, to madness. Uh, that, that if, you, if you look at these things element by element, like you're missing the structure that this is a matrix inverse. So you're missing the big picture. That, uh, and this, it seems really like these, these things should be easy, right? Um, 
And is the, this, this was the, the, the question by an anonymous student on the forum. So they posed the, this, this function. Let me suppose all the matrices are square just for simplicity. They could be non-square, right? So you say you have the trace of B minus AX transpose B minus X. So of course, that's the square of the Frobenius norm. And they said, what is it, you know, how do you differentiate? Do, you, do people have good resources for the rules behind this? It seems to be one of those things that is implicitly required for higher level statistics classes and ML classes, but is never taught at MIT, right? And again, this is what well, you have M squared inputs, you have a scalar output, so it seems like you might want ha have some kind of gradient uh, here. And indeed, this, this function is exactly, this is a, 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 the thing you might want to find the gradient of instead of equal to zero, because this is the function of uh, multiple right-hand sides least squares, right? You want to take the gradient set it equal to zero, and you should have the, 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 the equation for the solution. Of course, you can imagine ways of unrolling that, looking at column by column. But that's only marginally bit better than looking at it element by element, right? I mean, you should really be able to think of these matrices as a whole without having to break them into little pieces. And so, you know, Alan responded with the long explanation. Oops, this is out of batteries. That's okay, I'll just use the mouse. Um, and said, oh, you know, if there's a lot of interest, I might be willing to give some lectures over IAP over something, or something, and, and from that, this class was born. And you can say, well, why do you care? Okay, this is, there might be one of those, yes, we can, can, can we generalize differentiation to arbitrary Bonnock spaces or something like that, right? So, but, 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 but what does it actually matter outside of the tower of pure mathematics? And it actually matters a lot. Uh, the differentiation of complicated things is everywhere these days. Ah, oh, oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, so well, I'm not sure if this quite reaches, but uh, yeah, <laughs> that's okay. So um, I'll just turn this sideways so I can use the mouse. So, uh, so of course, the, the big one you know, that occupies a lot of uh, people's attention these days is machine learning, where they have in, going through incredibly complicated nonlinear functions that are comp compositions of lots of other things, and they want the derivative with respect to lots of parameters in those. So they're differentiating very complicated things, and they want to do it very efficiently. But this shows up all sorts of other places. So in engineering design, you, you might have a huge number of parameters that uh, describe some physical system, and you want to choose them to optimize something. So for example, people are actually, this has actually been built now, people are actually designing airplane wings by optimizing over a billion parameters and you know, describing the, the layout of the, the metal struts and basically choosing that to maximize how strong it is uh, for a given amount of weight or minimize the weight for a given amount of strength or something like that. Uh, um, and, and so this, this will often, you're, you're differentiating through a solution of a huge system of equations, you know, describing the physics. So this will often car involve carrying the chain rule precisely through A inverse, through this, this thing we saw. Um, you, you see it in, in physical modeling, fitting, sensitivity analysis is just one example where they, were, they, were, they, they had some giant model, airflow model of pollution, and they wanted to figure out the sensitivity of the, of the pollution to the emission you know, at every, every point in the North America. And you see it in multivariate statistics, data science. We saw a couple, two talks today which involved uh, optimizing functions. With, we, we had the log determinant of a matrix, and it actually, if you saw Justin Solomon's talk, and he, and you didn't blink, uh, he actually flashed past the derivative of the log determinant. He didn't actually point it out, um, but it was on the, it was on the slide uh, there. So, and, and like I said, these, these involve considerably more complicated seeming functions than A inverse even. You know, you might have the derivative, if the input is a matrix, you might want the derivative of like a factorization, of LU factorization or QR or SVD. You might want the derivative of the determinant or log determinant or eigenvalues or con derivative of condition number and so forth. The input might not just be a matrix, might be some other vector space, might be a function. Right, so you might have something that takes in a function of x and y, and spits out a number, the surface integral, and taking the, you might want to take the derivative of that area with respect to the function, and set it equal to zero, to find the conditions for a minimal surface. Right, in neural networks, see all sorts of complicated things, but you might stick in an image and a whole bunch of weights and stick it, pass it through a convolutional neural network and pass that through a loss function that matches it to some, something that's trying to predict whether it's a dog or cat or something like that. 
And you want to take the derivative of that, not with respect to the image usually, but with respect to all these parameters, all the, the entries of all the matrices and the, and, and the coefficients of all the, uh, of all the nonlinear ReLU functions and, the, the, uh, and the, the weights of all the little kernels you're convolving with. And you want to take the derivative with respect to those. Uh, of that, uh, that scalar function, or the, the, I already mentioned the engineering application where you're doing something like a, you know, a, a, a structural mechanics or a fluid flow simulation, and you want to take the derivative of the solution with respect to often millions of parameters to describe the shape in order to design it, or it shows up in, in, in biophysical models, or you have really complicated biophysical models. Uh, you know, huge systems of ODEs describing, you know, the, the, all sorts of systems in the body, and they actually take the derivatives of infection rates with respect to all the reaction rates of all sorts of different things going on in the body. Right, so you have the derivative of a solution of, an, of a huge system of ODEs with respect to coefficients that appear in those ODEs, right? And amazingly, even if you have a huge number of inputs, uh, like the million parameters or a billion parameters in, in, in engineering optimization or the millions of parameters in machine learning, it turns out you can differentiate a scalar valued function with respect to every one of those variables at the cost of essentially one more function evaluation. So in neural networks, you can evaluate the neural network one additional time backwards and you get all the derivatives at once. And so now you may have heard that there's this thing called automatic differentiation that will solve all our problems, right? And this, this turns it from a problem of calculus larger to a problem of compilers. It's really, the, really how these AD systems work is, is very far from, in, I mean, at a coarse grain viewpoint from how you do it by hand. And there's a huge number of systems for this. Uh, you know, Python, JAX is probably the most famous system right now. Julia, there's Zygote and Diffractor and Enzyme, and some of the people who wrote those are, are probably in the room. And there's a huge zoo of other, uh, you know, hundreds of them, uh, it seems like at this point, you know, dozens of, of ones that are pretty, uh, pretty full featured and sophisticated. And the dream of all these is you write a computer program that computes a function f of x that's differentiable, and it will generate or somehow you know, compute the derivative of that for, uh, 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 function for you with respect to all your parameters x and do so efficiently. And in many cases, these work great, but it still falls short. You can't use these for very long before running into a problem where they just completely fail to differentiate them, or they differentiate them but very, very inefficiently because they, they lose some structure uh, of the problem um, that they don't understand. And even when they do work, you need to have some understanding of what's going on in order to use them effectively, what's forward mode, reverse mode, what's going, what, you know, where do they work, where, where do they do not work well. And, and when they don't work well, or when they fail completely, you have to know what to, what to do, at least, at least at large scales. If you're, you have a small function of three variables, it's the right-hand side of a small ODE, they're, they're much more bulletproof uh, for, the, for the little tiny ones. Um, so, and, and these problems, so this is not a research talk. My, my, a lot of this stuff is pretty well understood. There's, there's still, of course, research going on at the frontiers of things, uh, frontiers of AD and so forth. Um, but a lot of stuff is well understood. But if you look around, the information for it is scattered across lots of different sources, in many cases, different fields. And you know, coming in you know, as an outsider to these things, it, it, it can be somewhat obscure. And so we, we, we felt like the time was ripe to try to start pulling this material together into a unified curriculum uh, to, to, to make it more approachable. I mean, it really should be approachable at a sophomore level by a class, a set of notes. Maybe someday even we have mutterings of a textbook, although you know the timeline for that might be the same as the timeline for his rand uh, Alan's random ma matrix textbook. We'll see. <laughs> And you know the, the basic issue is, with with uh, with all these differentiation, which students get stuck, is they get so good at taking derivatives, they think, uh, but you know they know all the rules down cold that. They forget what derivatives are, right? And so when you get to a more complicated thing, you try and focus on the rules rather than what the derivative is and how to extend it. So let me go back to the beginning and remind you what derivatives are, right? So a derivative is linearization. This is the very first picture you see about a derivative, that you have a function and it's the slope of the tangent, right? So what does that mean? So it means, oops, ah, what happened here? Oh no, uh, a, a term disappeared. Um, uh, I accidentally deleted something, it looks like. Okay, so 
Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So well, well, I'll focus on the small, the, the lower one here. So you, you have a, a small change in the input. Let's call it delta x. Okay, and you want to predict the change in the output, f of x plus dx. Right. So we'll call that delta f. Right. And you want to predict delta f from delta x, and that's that's all the derivative is. It's basically saying delta f is the change in f. Uh, it approximated as a linear function dropping higher order terms. So the equation that I accidentally must have hit the delete on was showing this for finite delta x, and then there's a, a little o of, uh, th there's a higher order term that you're dropping, right? So, uh, so you, you look at uh, uh, this equation, and, uh, and often students say, oh, that looks like a Taylor series. But of course, it's, it's much more basic than a Taylor series. It's the definition of a derivative. A derivative is a linear approximation for the change in the output, you know, plus neglecting higher order terms. So the derivative is whatever number you put here to get the change in f from a change in x to first order. Right? So that means the derivatives are linearization. That means derivatives are linear algebra. Now, and you can generalize this to if arbitrary vector spaces, arbitrary normed vector spaces. So it's, if, it's a no, if x is not a number, we have to be careful not to divide by it. So we can't, we normally, we say df dx equals f prime. But here, we're keeping the dx on the right-hand side. Right? So we, we, we want to say, now, x doesn't have to be a number. It's an arbitrary vector space, arbitrary, technically a normed vector space. You need a norm to define what it means to drop higher order terms. Right? And so you're going to say you have a small change in the input, and the output is also a vector space. Okay, uh, 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 y. Uh, and, and, and you have a small change in the input, and you want to ask what is the small change in the output? Let's we'll call that df. And to first order. So we're going to drop higher order terms, and it has to be some linear function of delta x, which means f. F primed has to be a linear operator that take, maps an x to a y, right? And so in, in the case of a scalar, if x is a number, f is a number, a linear operator is just a number, it's the slope. But in general, this is, is some, some linear operator. So this is, this is linear algebra. So calculus, differential calculus is all linear algebra. Um, but of course, it's often taught before they had linear algebra, the notion of a linear operator and so forth. But after they've had that, it makes sense to revisit these things. So, so for example, multivariable calculus, which is MIT is 1802, right? So you, have, you say you have n inputs, x, so they live in Rn, and you have m outputs, so they live in Rm. Then df is the change in f for a small change in x, and it should be a linear operator on dx. So you have a linear operator that takes something in Rn, a dx, a change in the input, and gives you something in Rm, a df, that's the change in the output. So what is that? That has to be an m by n matrix. And that m by n matrix is, in fact, the Jacobian matrix, whose, if we wanted out entry by entry, its entries are the partial derivatives of the components of f with respect to components of, of x. And what blows my mind is that students can take multivariable calculus and never see this. They never see that Jacobian matrix times a change in the input gives the change in the output to first order. And that, that is what the Jacobian matrix is. If they see a Jacobian matrix at all, they typically see it only in square the Jacobian matrices, only for changing variables in integral. They need to take the determinant, and you call it the Jacobian factor. Right? And since you take the determinant, it doesn't matter whether you transpose or not. So I could never remember which were the rows and the columns of this, of this thing. But of course, the rows are the outputs. The columns are the inputs, because it has to be this linear operator. Or, uh, you know, and, and a great example of that is, is a multidimensional Newton. So if you're trying to, so let's do the square case. So you have m equations and m variables, right? And you're trying to find a root of a function f. And now you're going to add a, not a dx, not an infinitesimal change, but a, you, you want to find the finite change in x, delta x, that makes this function 0. And so, well, you, you approximate this now to first order by f of x plus j de delta x, because it's the linearization. And then you just solve for delta x. And delta x is minus j inverse f. And that's your multidimensional Newton step. Right there, an incredibly useful algorithm, trivial to derive once you have this picture. But it's amazingly omitted from, I think, most multivariable calculus curriculums. So uh, um, the gradients, another great example. So there you have n inputs, x and rn. And you have a scalar output. You have a single number. So then, same formula. It's the, the change in the output, the change in the scalar, for a small change in the input, has to be a linear operator that takes a vector and gives you a scalar. 
And that linear operator is, we may call it a row vector. Um, and I call it, if we're fancy, we might call it a linear form or co-vector, right? And we could also call it the transpose of the gradient. Right? So I want the gradient to be a column vector to have the same shape as x so that it's the direction uphill. So you can do gradient ascent, for example. So it gives you the direction to go towards the maximum. And so the derivative is now the transpose of this. It's the linear operator that takes in a vector. argue about this, and I hope nobody will. Yeah. It's, yeah, the derivative is a row vector, gradient is a column. So, yeah, so, and you can generalize this to arbitrary, arbitrary vector spaces that have a, an inner product. Same idea, x is an arbitrary Hilbert space, a vector space with an inner product, right? And f sends that to a number. So, what is the derivative? It has to tell you the change in the output, a scalar, for a small change in the input to first order. So it has to be a linear form, right? A linear form maps a, a vector, is a fancy name for something that vac maps a vector to a number in a, in a linear way, right? But there's, there's a theorem that any, any linear form, on, if you have a dot product, you can write as a, it's just a dot product with something. So this has to be a dot product of x with something, and that, that, that's something we call the gradient. Now, if you have a fancier vector space, your, your inner product might be fancier than your Euclidean uh, product, but, it, but you can always define a gradient in this way. And it will be the up, uphill direction in the, in, the, in the norm that's induced by that inner product. Right? And so now we have this matrix calculus is easy, at least for simple things. Right? So suppose you have f of x equals x squared. So x is an, an m by m matrix. You're squaring it. right? And you want to say, OK, so if I change, if I change x a little bit by, x, by dx, uh, 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 you know, uh, think of it as an arbitrary small matrix, but we're going to throw out higher order terms. That's what the d means. right? Uh, and then the what is the change in the output to first order? And it's easy to, to see. You can actually just, for x squared, you can just see it explicitly. Right? X, x plus dx squared minus x squared. The x squared term cancels. There's a dx squared term which will drop because it's higher order. And then what's left is x dx plus dxx. You can also just see it as the product rule. It's the derivative of x times x. There's a dxx and an x dx, but it's not commutative. So I can't write it as 2x dx anymore. Right? And this is a perfectly good linear operator. It takes a dx in. It gives you a matrix out. It's linear. Right? We don't have to write it as a matrix times dx. We, we could with Kronecker products and vectorization and so forth, but we don't have to. It's, it's actually much nicer to think of it in this form for many purposes. X inverse is a little trickier, but not too hard. Then the trick is to consider the change of X inverse times X, right? So, you're gonna, it, it, so D of this means, how does this change to first order for a small change in X? Well, product rule again, so I haven't derived the product rule, but it works the same way, right? Product rule, this is DX inverse times X plus X, inverse times dx, but that whole thing is x inverse x for any x is the identity matrix, so it doesn't matter how I change x, di is zero. So if you just solve for uh, dx inverse, just by moving this to the side, multiplying both sides by x inverse, you find that df, or dx inverse, is this. Right? So this is your minus one over x squared uh, analog here. Now there's an x inverse on sandwich on both sides. And you can't, you can't unsandwich it because, again, they don't commute. But this is a perfectly good linear operator. Right. So th this, these are matrix derivatives. What about matrix gradients? So this, is, this actually shows up in the, the problem this, the student posed. Right? So this is a, something that takes a matrix x in and gives you a number out. So it should have some kind of gradient. So if you just carry through the product rule, just do a little bit of algebra, which I'll skip on this, this function, you find that the change in f to first order for a small change in x is just a trace of some matrix times dx. But a trace of something times dx is actually a kind of inner product. We, 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 it, it's, the, it's what's called the Frobenius inner product of two matrices. It's just a trace of x transpose y. It's like the generalization of Euclidean product. And so, the transpose of this thing, thing here is the gradient of this. And if you want to find the minimum of this, is a nice convex function. So you want to find its minimum, you just set the gradient equal to 0. And the gradient equal to 0, you, you can very quickly see you're going to get the normal equations. right? If it, if it just, because it is just least squares with more than one right-hand side. What about 
the, the chain rule deserves some, some comment because it really plays in the computational efficiency, right? So if suppose you have a function f of x that's f1 of x, f2 of x, f3 of x, just a composition. It, if once you see the pattern for 3, you can follow it for n. So poor man's induction, right? <laughs> Uh, so DF, DF, again, it's just, I won't derive it, but it's really easy to work out. It's not complicated math, just to, just to go straight from the definition of this. That the change in F for a small change in X is just, you take the small change in X and first you do the F1 prime, that, that linear operator, then the F2 prime, then the F3 prime linear operator. It's just the composition of the three li linear operators. Just like this is the composition of three functions, the derivative is the composition of the three linearizations. No, no biggie there. So this. Yeah, yeah. So the, I didn't put. I, I suppressed the arguments for simplicity. Yes. So F three prime is evaluated at F two, F one, and so forth. Right. Um, so. Okay, let's do it in simple case. Let's suppose that these are ordinary vectors. Okay, so x is a column vector of n numbers. F1, its output is an RM1. F2, its output is an RM2. F3 is, is an RM. So it, F sends X in RN to X in RM. So this thing is, again, the, the composition of three linear operators. It's the product of three Jacobian matrices. So the, the chain rule for this kind of thing is just a product, ordinary matrix product of Jacobians. It's a product of an M, M by M2, M2 by M1, M1 by N matrix. And of course, matrix products aren't commutative, so we can't, I can't just put those in any order I want. right? But, but it is associative, so it really matters for computation in which order I do the multiplication. And so there's two famous orders. One is called forward mode, where I go from inputs to outputs. I put parentheses here. And this is going to be, this is going to be good uh, if a good idea if dx is small, like if, if n is, is small, say n is 1, right? You have one input going to many outputs. Reverse mode going the other direction is good if it's just putting parentheses in the other place. It's just going left to right versus right to left. It's, uh, this is much faster if, if the number of outputs is small, and the most, the most ideal case is when is n equals 1. You have, you have a bunch of inputs. You have one output. That's the case in optimization. You're always opti you're opt maximizing a scalar function, maybe of lots of parameters. You always want to go left to right or uh, reverse mode. And then this, is, this over here is a row vector. right? So you're doing vector times matrix, and then you get a new row vector, and then row vector times matrix, so you get another matrix. So you always want to do multiple products of small things with large things, not large things with large things. Right? And this is such a stupid, simple trick. Okay, go left to right versus left to right. Uh, it's obvious. But it lets you do things that are almost miraculous. It lets you uh, differentiate through, uh, through the, you know, systems of differential you know, equations and things like that uh, um, in, in the time that costs, basically the cost of evaluating one additional time. And I think I'm just, about out of time, so I, well, well, I wasn't able to show you, but I, I want to do a function that was a function of A inverse B. Right, right, the, the function of a solution of a system of equations where A, the matrix, depends on the parameters P. And if you just do the chain rule, now you have the derivative of that matrix inverse. We just, we just derived that formula of a minus A inverse D A A inverse. And the whole trick is to put parentheses on the left. Right, it, it, F is a scalar function. So you compute this row vector that's called an ad, it, it, the adjoint solution. It's just a solution of the same equations with the transpose. And then once you've done that, the, the thing on the right is the original solution. All your derivatives are just dot products. And usually very sparse. The, usually the, the derivative of A with the parameters is very sparse. So, this is, so it's cheap. So I, I, I want to stop there. Um, but you know, so we had 16 hours of, of material, and think oh, in the beginning we we're like, oh, we can explain, you know, linear, derivatives, of linear operators. One day, how much left will we have to? What, how are we are we going to fill the remaining 15 hours? But of course, we, we couldn't possibly. You know, differentiation turns out to be such a rich subject uh, that we could only you know cover a small slice of it, an interesting slice of it with a lot of topics. But there's tons of stuff we didn't cover. So that, that are you know there's abstruse things that you might not come up with very, come up against very often, like differential topology. But there's incredibly useful things, like what if you have a function of a complex variable, 
that's not analytic, which is basically every function you might want to optimize, a function that, that takes complex numbers in and gives you a real, real number out, is not analytic. A complex analysis course tells you you can't differentiate that. But in fact, you can. There's, there's a very straightforward generalization of, you can't differentiate it, but there's a generalization called CR, or Vertiger calculus, that you can explain to a freshman, well, if they understand complex numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not, uh, it's not and, there, and there's a bunch of things like that. So hopefully, we're, you know, we're collecting material. Hopefully, we'll have uh, more pedagogical material online. But I, I feel like this is, this is not the, the type of material that we should just leave for students to, to completely pick up on their own by the seat of their pants. I mean, there's a, once they have calculus linear algebra, which so many students do, they should really see some of this stuff. It's so important now to be able to take derivatives. And it's so amazing to see people using these AD systems that they use it, it doesn't work, and then they're just completely screwed. They, they have no idea what to do because they, they, they never learned any of these kinds of rules. So they don't know how differentiate derivatives work with complex functions, complicated functions and complex functions. <laughs> okay, I'll stop there, and, and we'll head over to the thing. So not to uh, belabor the point, but when you get to a matrix calculus, do we still need the notion of a gradient at all? I mean, because it is just a Jacobian of a function with one output. Could it be, could it be easier to do the pedagogy if we just delete the, the idea of a gradient, just always say, it's always Jacobians, it's just always a linear operator? No, I don't think so, because then you can't, one, you, you, you need the gradient if you, you need the Rice representation theorem. That's a linear form, you can represent it as a dot product with something if you want to do gradient ascent or gradient descent. And that's like one of the huge applications of AD is optimization, right? So if you don't have a gradient, you can't do that. So you, I think you still need that, uh, that picture. Let's take all the last again. Okay.